is someone that I'm completely new to, all thanks to friend and frequent collaborator Jonas, who I got to share an experience with. You see, this album was announced way back in December of 2021 and was supposed to be released on January 7th, 2022 but then it never dropped. And now you see, Romcom was announced way back in December of 2021 and was supposed to be released in February of 2022, but then it never fucking happened. I wrote that back in June, can you tell? Anyways, pain aside, Rise of Monarch is out and it's, uh, pretty good. I forgot that Amelie makes music. <laughs> So the production on this being as good as it is surprised me. The title track is a short intro that's very beautiful, with Amelie giving off some Maria Brink vibes when it comes to her singing. From the Embers is an absolute vibe with these chopped up backing vocals during the pre-chorus. There's no way I could not like this track. Metamorphosis has this dark atmosphere that turns into an absolute power anthem during the chorus. Speaking of the chorus, that long note that she holds right before is so fucking powerful, holy hell. Monster You Made is a semi-haunting song theoretically fueled by pain, and I gotta say, we go in two for two on the relatability factor as a content creator for nine years. Villain Vibes was originally the only song I was gonna listen to because it has Callie on it, but I guess I just said fuck it and listened to the whole thing, and I'm honestly glad I did. Anyways, the song had a pretty fun moment happen. You see, when I first listened to the song, it had gone for a pretty good length, yet Callie hadn't appeared. And I had the thought, I wonder when Callie's gonna join. And then immediately after I said that, her verse started. <laughs> and it's a great verse, it's a great hook, it's a great song. Though I will say I appreciate this version of the hook a lot more. Messing with the Wrong Bitch is another power anthem, but like, Disney-fied? But at least like the good Disney? Or at least the version that everyone liked? And I get that, but I also never grew up on them. I've seen a fair bit of clips from a fair bit of the movies, and according to my parents, I've seen a couple of them, but I have, like, no memory of that. Anyways, point is, it's got Renaissance Disney villain vibes, and that's cool. I, 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 I like it when the lady go control. Call Me King has vocal chops, so 10 out of 10, but it's, it's a nice anthem. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. It's a nice pop album that tells the lore of her VTubing characters, as well as brings in a lot of bangers and some relatability if you're in the YouTube realm. I've been looking forward to a Tropic Gold project since I first heard Need to Know, and while it's not an album, I find the CP to be incredibly good. For one, I feel like this is where they finally signified, at the very least, a baseline for their sound. They start as yet another normal-sounding rock band with their first couple of singles, Need to Know established a calmer, vibey sound, and then they've been able to implement that heaviness back into their music while combining it with the previously established Need to Know sound. And the singles leading up to this were great. If you want to go ending up on my favorite songs of 2021 list, Pretty Stranger was admittedly forgettable in the beginning, but it's grown on me knowing that the song's about falling in love with a stranger, maybe just on the basis of looks and wanting to be with them because you hate being alone. Or at least that's how I view it and dot mood. Like We Used To being the final single and is my favorite song on the EP, except the version of the EP brings in a woman doing the vocals during the second verse, which sounds alright, but then after that the song just ends up sounding like shit compared to the single version. But like we used to, felt like another step forward for their sound and them continuing to bring new things forward in it. Overall comes out being this catchy vibe with an immense amount of replayability. Only negative I have to say about it is that I always heard him saying hang me like you used to when the line is actually hate me like you used to. And I don't know, I just feel like hang me is better. Hate me feels a little basic while hang me may sound edgy to some, but to me it sounds like a more darker and interesting route. It reminds me of John Bellion's Guillotine and how he described it as a Tim Burton love song. The opening track, The Way You Love, is yet another banger that I've gotten the chorus stuck in my head multiple times, and without a doubt my favorite part of the track is during the build-up of the final chorus where the guitar plays the same melody as the vocal and is timed along with it. It is a certified nut moment. The EP ends with Wish You Were Here, which was a complete shock to me because it's not something I expected from this band. A four-minute ballad-esque song that progressively grows in energy and instruments as the song goes, while having probably the best and most detailed lines in their discography so far. And while it's a bit cheesy, I like the bridge referencing If You Wanna Go and Like We Used To. In true Tropic Gold fashion, every song, writing-wise at least, is basically the same. They're all about wanting to be with someone, and I'm fine with that. I was a Five Finger Death Punch fan for seven years. I'm fine with a band just writing the same thing. <laughs> Overall, I think it's a solid debut EP, and like always, I look forward to the future of the band and their debut album. 
Speaking of Five Finger Death Punch, they had an album drop, and I do not care about it at all. And this should sound weird to anybody who is at the very least familiar with me and my content, because I loved the band growing up. Like I just said earlier, I was a fan of theirs for seven years, but I found around last year that I was just not really enjoying their music all that much. But Fate, Fate was the exception. Fate was the album I continued to still really like, because it was such a step forward for the band and showed a promising future, continuing to feel like they were moving along with me and how I was feeling. And then that just didn't happen. Yeah, this album is a massive step back with them sounding like they're trying to just go back to their older sound and make those older songs to the point that some of these feel like Wish.com versions of previously released tracks. The title track sounds like Wish.com under and over it. Blood and Tar, Scar Tissue, Thanks for Asking is a little bit off. Gold Gutter just straight up sounds like a Got Your Six B-side. And it's also just the most forgettable album in their discography. My problem with Injustice For None that made me rank it as my least favorite album of theirs was that it didn't really feel like it had a distinct sound unlike the rest of the albums, but a lot of the songs are still memorable to me. I can look at the track list and remember what most of these songs are. I can barely do that with Afterlife, and for most of the tracks, I can't even remember a single detail about them. The most memorable standout song on here is Judgment Day for the inclusion of Trap Percussion and Ivan Rapping, which surprisingly sounds pretty good, not gonna lie. But in the end, I feel nothing anymore when listening to that song. It's just such a disappointment, honestly, with, like I said, Fate had such a promising future for the band, and then they just took this step back, and it's my least favorite album from them. And like with Hollywood Undead, I no longer listen to Five Finger Death Punch anymore, so this is probably going to be the last time I talk about them for a while. So my favorite band released what I consider to be their worst album. And so my second favorite band did the same thing. Planet Zero was a concept album about the planet being a rundown apocalypse, all because of cancel culture. No, I am not kidding. I wish I was. There is fucking no other reason given as to why the world would become the dystopia that the album's about. It's just cancel culture. It's mentioned on here like five fucking times. The title track is all about it. And even Zach Myers said that the album is about anti-cancel culture. And I'm just so fucking sick of hearing about this. Cancel culture doesn't exist. It doesn't work. It's a broken system that solely exists on Twitter.com, a website where only 5% of the planet resides, and we've seen time and time again of examples of people being cancelled just to continue having a thriving career. And not only is this just a boomer take for a concept album, but it also continues to feed the stereotype that Americans think that America is the entire world, because the album is literally called Planet Zero. They are referring to the Earth as a whole, and its population of 7.7 .7 billion people falling under because of some small minority of that 5% doesn't want people to have careers, and overall cancel culture is an issue that only really resides in America, we're the only country that gives so much shit about a non-existent thing. It is such a rare occurrence for someone to be truly cancelled, so the concept of this album is dumb as fuck, but also the album is just not good in my opinion. It is a very slow album with ballads happening back to back to back, which I'm pretty sure Sound of Madness did the same thing, but for some reason that actually worked because that album is a joy from track one all the way to the ninth bonus track on the 2010 Deluxe, but here it just feels like a fucking slog. Not to mention they pulled a Linkin Park and throw an interlude after every other track and don't give me that it's a concept album bullshit because you can make a concept album without needing to put an interlude after every other track. Look at The Wall. It's a classic for a reason. Other than that, there aren't really any highlights in the track list for me. Just a disappointing and annoying album and easily my least favorite in their discography and I, I i fucking really hate saying that also friend and frequent collaborator jonas pointed out something i hadn't really thought about we had a worldwide pandemic the black lives matter resurgence the capital was stormed russia invaded ukraine and is still there and we're looking at 2008 the sequel and all you can talk about is twitter.com all right well i finally rewatched no way home 
a lot sooner than I thought I would, but I can actually give my proper thoughts in the movie now knowing how everything plays out and seeing it twice. And I honestly put it best with my Letterboxd review. It's a mid-Spider-Man film that does the bare minimum, but the nostalgia bait makes it dumb fun. Yeah, they finally gave Peter consequences for his selfish actions and even had him be selfless, but isn't that just the bare minimum? I would have rather just had this already be happening in his trilogy instead of it taking three fucking movies to, like I said, do the bare minimum. With that being said, I still enjoy Toby and Andrew being in this movie, and when it comes to this version of the movie, the scene where they're all just talking shit and bantering before fighting off the villains got extended, and I would honestly just take a whole movie of that. Hell, give it the Snyder Cut treatment and make it four hours. Speaking of deleted scenes, there are some that I understand why they were deleted, some that just kind of restate things, and others like the previously mentioned banter scene that do it in a way that enhance the movie a bit and make it more fun. I also don't hate that Aunt May is the one to deliver the great power comes great responsibility line because friend and frequent collaborator Jonas made me realize that in the timeline of everything, mentioning Uncle Ben now would just feel off and, and you know, that's understandable. Which is why he should have just been a fucking thing from the beginning, but that's a different tangent that currently has 9,000 views and ended up in a Godzilla Mandora video. And while I can enjoy the villains a bit more knowing how the movie ends, there are some things that still confuse me. Like Doc Ock is here because he knows Peter is Spider-Man, but he states in the movie that he had Spider-Man in his arms before he got teleported. But that whole scene in the movie is the moment where Doc Ock becomes good, but he's evil in the movie. So, did he get teleported right before Peter started speaking? But Toby's Peter in No Way Home says that he and MJ worked things out, which means that he would have been from post-Spider-Man 3. H how did he survive the sun then? Because Doc Ock is the reason why they got out of there alive. <laughs> Plot holes hurt my head. My favorite part of the movie was when the entire auditorium was empty and my friend and I thought that that was really fucking funny and we're kind of hoping that it would stay that way the entire time. <laughs> this movie was way too inspirational for me. <laughs> Bullet Train is a fun action comedy directed by David Leitch, who directed Deadpool 2, Atomic Blonde, and I guess John Wick as well, but was uncredited according to IMDb, so take that with a grain of salt. And I know this movie hasn't been for everyone, but personally for me... I loved it. Every actor in here is amazing, and for a movie I only watched because of Brad Pitt, he ends up not even being my favorite actor in the film, because that title goes to Brian Tyree Henry as Lemon, because holy fuck I loved his character. I love all the characters in here, but Lemon is a Thomas the Tank Engine fan, and as someone who grew up being a massive fan as a child, every mention of Thomas made me very giddy. The thing that made this inspirational for me is that, yes, this is an action comedy movie, but the overall theme of it is to not control fate which, given the mindset I was in at the time when I saw this, that really spoke to me, and it honestly did help me go down a much better path to view life in. Who would have guessed that the Brad Pitt movie with the Google Translate moment is what got me to start viewing life differently? <laughs> On a more technical standpoint, more specifically the pacing, the constant flashbacks were a little weird at first, but by the end of the movie, they just felt like they fit really well, and it does add a lot more comedy and enjoyment in the film, in my opinion. That's all I really have to say, to be honest. I had a great time when I saw this, but to be fair, I haven't seen it since its opening, so I am due for a rewatch. Don't Worry Darling is aggressively mid. Now, to be fair, I went into the movie with some biases, what with all the drama that went down in the lead-up to its release, where as far as I know, the story goes that Shia LaBeouf was supposed to be in the movie, got replaced with Harry Styles, who was Olivia Wilde's boyfriend. Wilde then said that it was because of his acting style being dangerous to the set, and then Shia LaBeouf clapping back with a video of Olivia Wilde crying and begging him to come back to the team. Now, whether that is true or not, don't know, don't care. I just know that this is what I heard going into the movie. So I couldn't help but constantly think about how Jack could have been played by an actual actor and not Harry fucking Styles. And don't get me wrong, I don't hate Harry Styles. I once had a dream where he said that he used to draw hentai and self-insert himself into fan fictions, and that was enough to make him my favorite One Direction member. And I respect the hell out of him for breaking gender norms. Dude seems like a cool guy. But as many other people have said it, he is not an actor. I also couldn't help but be aware of how aggressively British his accent is while he's surrounded by a bunch of American accents. 
Also, the decision for Olivia Wilde to cast her boyfriend in a role where his only character trait is I want to fuck Florence Pugh is a little weird. I mean, I get it, movie magic is not really sex, but I don't know, still kind of weird. Regardless, all of that is irrelevant, and what I should be focusing on is the movie itself. Which is two hours of nothing. Like, I know it's not a great comparison by any means, but Florence Pugh being in a movie about a strange cult where weird shit happens and everyone acts like it's normal kind of reminds me of another much better movie where Florence Pugh ends up in a strange cult where weird shit happens and everyone acts like it's normal. And I can't help but wish I was watching that instead. Florence Pugh is the best part of the movie. And the twist this movie has is literally Harry Styles can't fuck Florence Pugh one night, so he decides to make her unconscious and put her into a VR world where he then gaslights her. And no, I'm not using that in the Twitter sense. He literally gaslights her by definition. And there's this weird thing where Olivia Wilde says that they're gonna kill Florence Pugh in the real world because she figured everything out. And then the movie just ends the moment she leaves the world. Like, I'm sorry, based on the information that you gave me, Florence Pugh is still in danger. I mean, I know Olivia says that when someone dies in the world, they die in real life, so maybe she just means that them trying to kill her in the VR world will kill her in real life, but the line didn't really come across that way to me. It sounded like she was saying that they're now in the real world going to Florence Pugh's house to kill her, and if that's the case, then I can reasonably assume that they're still going to do that. Also, Chris Pine's wife kills him to take charge of the hunt for Florence, and then I don't think I saw her in any scene after that. Like, it's not a bad movie. It's competently directed, and the actual actors know what they're doing and are giving good performances. But the writing is so flawed and basic, as well as the directing being pretty generic, that this just becomes a movie that feels like several other better movies shoved into one mediocre waste of time. I watched Barbarian immediately after Don't Worry Darling, and maybe that makes the movie look even better, but regardless, this is a good movie. This is one of those where uh, everything I have to say is what everyone else is saying, so I don't really have anything to add to the conversation. I just want it to be stated that I've seen it, it's good, would highly recommend it. And like everyone else has been saying, if you can, watch it without knowing anything, because trust me, I did that and it was fucking great. Terrifier 2 is a movie that exists. I don't know why. I don't know if I would say I was hyped for this. I remember liking the first Terrifier movie, even though it had no plot or point other than being a gore demo reel. But going into the sequel, I heard that it actually has a story, and therefore to some people, that makes it good. And to that I say, did we watch the same movie? I cannot begin to explain to you what the story is, because I really do not think there is one. There's plot points, the final girl's brother is obsessed with art, and then the final girl meets art, and then the final girl's friends get killed by art, and then the final girl's brother gets kidnapped, and then the final girl goes to the carnival, and then the final girl kills art, but everything in between is the most stupidest, pointless, boring shit I've seen in a while. Maybe the Chucky TV series just ruined horror for me. <laughs> like, what is this fucking subplot about the dad that goes absolutely nowhere? What is this imaginary child that I guess nobody can see except for Art, the final girl, and her brother? That's just never explained. Oh, and if you're someone that doesn't like piece of shit characters being pieces of shit for no reason other than being a piece of shit in a horror movie, I would not recommend this. The mom does nothing but scream at her own children. One of the final girl's friends literally just drugs her Ari Shafir style and then does nothing else but fucking complain. This movie was also obnoxiously loud, especially when you get into the carnival and they play the same jump scare like 25 fucking times. This has zero reason being two and a half hours long, and I'm honestly glad to start seeing more and more negative reviews of the movie. If all you want is two and a half hours of torture porn and over-the-top gore to the point that it's cartoony and find joy in a woman being brutally torn apart limb for limb for like ten minutes straight, then I guess this is the movie for you. Uh, it's not for me, and I'm gonna go sit in the corner and silently judge you. <laughs> Okay, so starting off, I only watched the first three episodes that were released for free on YouTube, and I have no intention of going back. Not because it's bad, 
It's not good, but it's not terrible. I just have zero interest in Ruby as a whole aside from Crow, and the only reason why I watched Ice Queendom was because friend and frequent collaborator Jonas, who is a fan of the original, was curious about how this reboot would play out for someone who's never watched the show before. And so I wanted to fill in that role, and I can say that in the beginning it made sense, and by the end it didn't. Apparently they crammed, like, most of the first volume into the first three episodes, and you definitely feel that by the end. There is a moment in the third episode where a store gets robbed, and then it just cuts to a cat girl walking away from the store that is now burning, and they make absolutely zero acknowledgement of what the fuck happened. I enjoyed it a bit, but seeing bits and pieces of the original show just shows me that it's the superior version out of the two, but... Like I said, I don't really have any interest in watching either. If you have an interest, though, I, I guess I'd recommend the original. I don't normally review documentaries. I don't normally watch documentaries. But one night, I was on HBO Max looking for some random TV garbage to fall asleep to when I stumbled upon an episode of a show called Rich and Shameless that was called Girls Gone Wild Exposed. And as a recovering porn addict with his own personal history with Girls Gone Wild, which is... Fucking weird to say because I had a phone by the time I hit puberty. Girls Gone Wild just doesn't seem like something that should have been on my radar. But regardless, I decided to give it a watch, and holy fucking shit. If you can find a way to watch this episode, I highly recommend stopping the video right now and go watch it. It is a fucking trip and a half. Sadly, it's not a surprising story given the porn industry's history of abuse, but as someone who just thought of Girls Gone Wild as flashing videos with some annoying dude constantly talking, it is a fucking shock how much of a piece of shit Joe Francis was behind the scenes and the shit that happened. I mean, I guess it's not that much of a shock if you look at who he is. I mean, I mean, come on. If I told you this man was a rapist, would you be surprised? <laughs> it is an emotional watch. I mean, obviously trigger warning for sexual abuse, but holy fuck. Joe Francis is just a fucking villain, and it's so fucked that he's still out there. Motherfucker fled to Mexico and literally cannot get punished for his crimes unless he steps foot in this country, which there's no way in hell he ever will. Like... This man filmed two 17-year-olds in a shower and tried to say Girls Gone Wild is a documentary. Like, like, he's fucking dumb, but he ain't that dumb to step foot into this country again. I do think it's nice that his victims finally had a place to talk, even though, sadly, they'll probably never get that closure of that piece of shit being in jail. But at least his crimes and the truth behind all that shit is now more open, and hopefully more and more people can learn about it. I will say, the best part about the documentary is the funny Florida man who was hell-bent on putting Joe in prison. I loved him so much. Yeah, it's a, it's a good documentary, and I would highly recommend it if you can handle those topics. And, uh... And, uh, yeah, here's hoping that Joe gets what he fucking deserves. <laughs> wow, this is a tonal fucking whiplash. <laughs> this show was a nice watch. Let's balance out the abuse with wholesomeness. I haven't watched Big Hero 6 since it initially came out, which is almost 10 years ago, and that makes me feel very old. But the one thing I loved the most about the movie, like anyone else, was Baymax. So when it was announced that the show was coming out, I was immediately sold. Plus, the trailer was pretty funny and adorable and showed that it was going to be more of what was great about Big Hero 6. I did not expect, however, to almost cry during one of the episodes. Speaking of the episodes, they are basically shorts that could easily just go up on YouTube, but Disney being Disney, well, you know. But it is a fun watch throughout, with each episode continuing that initial theme of loss and grief that the original movie had, but showing it in different ways. And the thing that made me almost cry was when it was directed towards a cat. There is a scene in this where a stray cat sees a family cat playing with a mouse toy, so he grabs bits and pieces of trash to form his own mouse toy, and then cuddles up to it while underneath a food stand and looks so sad that even me just writing this makes me incredibly sad and I feel like I might start crying. I, I have such a soft spot for cats and seeing this moves me so much. 
And while it's never explicitly stated, my headcanon is that the old lady from the first episode adopts the cat, and I love it, and you cannot convince me otherwise. There's also an episode where you hear about periods and sort of learn about them, and while it's very appreciated, it feels very weird seeing it in a Disney property. Would recommend if you're a fan of Big Hero 6 or even just a fan of Baymax as a character, and if you want some fun yet also emotional shorts, I mean, hell, it'll only take you less than an hour to get through the whole season. Alright, um, I'm gonna sound like the typical Star Wars fan, so if you don't want to hear that, you can leave. That's fine. Hope you enjoy whatever you watch instead. God, where the fuck do I begin? Okay, so I got my hopes up after episode 2, and I, I really wish I hadn't, because this quickly became the most disappointing, aggravating, and pointless thing I have ever seen so far from Disney's Star Wars. I just don't see how this was a necessary story to tell. Allegedly, there was a more darker, better version of the show when it first got greenlit, but countless changes turned it into what we ended up getting, and I say allegedly because my source is Alana Pierce. Are all happy. I know somebody who, improved. who worked on it, um, that I like won't even give insight to what their job was, who said that the show went through a lot of inter iterations and that he was very upset that what they had at the start wasn't what came out at the end. They really had to iterate a lot and change a lot of things. Take that as you will. But how did we get here? I, 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 I would like to know. I want to know who at Lucasfilms thought that an Obi-Wan show should have Obi-Wan be a fucking side character. Why an Obi-Wan show should focus so heavily on the Inquisitors. Why an Obi-Wan show should feature an absolutely total fucking useless plotline about Reva trying to kill Luke when we all know that's not gonna happen because how the fuck could that happen? How did the writers write themselves into such a fucking massive corner? I don't get it. Remember when I said I hoped Reva becomes a better character? She doesn't. She, in fact, should be fucking dead, but this is basically the Reva show, so she gets to survive Vader's wrath despite constantly fucking up during every single move and even betraying him. In what universe does Vader give someone this many fucking chances and willingly leaves her alive after she just tried to kill him, but then chokes out multiple people for doing far less? In what universe am I supposed to be afraid of Reva when she can't even get information from a fucking ten-year-old? And don't forget the terrible choreography, the terrible CGI, and just overall the terrible writing. There are things established and then never spoken about again. Whatever happened to Robert Pattinson's brother with Down Syndrome? That dude got hung in the middle of Mos Espa and then just was forgotten. Hell, I forgot about it until Robert Meyer Burnett brought it up. There was also that moment where they gave an origin story to the certain point of view that Obi-Wan viewed Anakin and Vader, and that is a very dividing moment in the shelf from what I can see, and I am on the side of, I fucking hate this. Why can't things just exist? Why does everything need to have a fucking backstory? I liked it better when that line sounded like a coping mechanism that Obi-Wan uses to get over the guilt of feeling responsible for what happened to Anakin and letting Luke view the father as the good guy Obi once knew and not as the evilest man in the galaxy, which would later result in one of the most iconic scenes in film history and Luke later bringing Vader back to the light side and not something that Obi-Wan just hears from Vader and goes, oh, I didn't think about that, I'm gonna use that from now. The ending scene honestly pissed me off because it showed a much better version of the show. It literally ends with an opening to what could have been instead of just being what it should have been. It's called Obi-Wan Kenobi and you went through the effort of bringing back Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen to reprise the roles but they're so painfully underused in replacement for a completely different plot for a TV show that I give zero fucks about. Why should I care about Reva? There is literally zero reason why I should care about her. If you wanted to make a show about Sith politics and Inquisitors and focus on one that's actually good, even though that twist doesn't make any sense because she's getting revenge on Anakin for killing her friends, but then spend God knows how long killing how many fucking Jedi and how many of them were kids? For fuck's sake, she tried to kill Luke in the last episode anyway! But whatever. You wanted to make that show, you could have, but instead, you just shoved it into what's supposed to be an Obi-Wan series. Actually, honestly, what should have just been an Obi-Wan movie? What I would have liked to see is a series that went more in-depth into the psychology and mind state that Obi-Wan would be in. 
After the events of Revenge of the Sith, feeling like a failure as a trainer and also Qui-Gon's Padawan given how he made a promise and in the end he failed to keep, and then later find out that his Padawan that went rogue and he left to die on Mustafar is the evilest man in the galaxy that has been running a fucking empire and killing god knows how many people, there has to be so much PTSD, trauma, and overall fucked mental state that it could have made for a really great psychological look at the character. And not only that, it would have made up for the obvious nostalgia bait by providing something that hasn't been done in Star Wars, at least in live action. And maybe that was the original idea, I don't know. But instead, what we got was six half-baked episodes of the fucking Reva show, and I, as a Star Wars fan, I'm, I'm just fucking done. I'm tired of getting my hopes up, even when my expectations are on the fucking ground, just to then be spit at. I have barely enjoyed anything Disney has brought to Star Wars, and after this fucking mess, I just can't be fucked to care anymore. Mando Season 3 is gonna come out, and I'm probably not gonna watch it. And they got that new Andor series coming out at the time of me writing the script, and it's already out by the time of me recording, and it's supposed to be totally 100% original with Zero Nostalgia Bait, and I just don't fucking care about it. Taika Waititi was allegedly supposed to make a Star Wars movie at some point. At this point, I don't even know if that's true. Even then, I just have zero intention on seeing it, or just any other fucking Star Wars movie. After this colossal disappointment, I do not give a fuck about anything Star Wars related that is released from here on out, and I just don't want to be a part of it. Just give me a new hope, Empire, and Backstroke of the West, and that's it. I want nothing else. And of course, everyone has their own opinion, but my opinion is the best opinion. I'm sure you figured that out already.